Welcome back to the channel. Today in our Unsung Movie series, we're going to cover a Tim Burton film from 2003, Big Fish, which received mixed reviews from critics when it was first released and did modestly well. As always, I'm going to present a different way of looking at the movie that will hopefully give people new insights and maybe encourage some to see Big Fish again, or maybe for the first time. Big Fish is the story of Edward Bloom, played by Albert Finney, who is a man who tells tall tales that no one believes. His son William, played by Billy Crudup, has a strained relationship with his father because he feels he can't tell the truth about his life and instead embellishes his stories with what William feels are gross exaggerations or outright lies. Although estranged for years, William and his wife Josephine, played by Marion Cotillard, Return to William's childhood home to help his mother Sandra, played by Jessica Lang, take care of Edward, whom they hear is reaching the final stages of his life. William thinks back on his father and the stories that he told him when he was young. The stories in the movie are portrayed through the eyes of a young Edward Bloom, played by Ewan McGregor, as he lives in the stories he told to a young William. It's a novel perspective, but it allows us to hear what William actually heard. The stories start off strange, but believable if you're willing to ignore a thing or two, but they soon become more fanciful, and the viewer starts to understand why William, after hearing these stories told by his father as the gospel truth, can now be annoyed at his apparent lack of honesty. In the first story, Edward is a young child, going on a local adventure with four friends, one of whom is played by young Miley Cyrus. The kids sneak up on a house owned by what they think is a witch who has a glass eye that allows the viewer to see how they're going to die. Now, this story is, for the most part, believable. Kids check out houses all the time, they have good imaginations, and it's not hard to see how after many years a simple story could change into something a little more fanciful. The second story involves Edward meeting a giant, played by Matthew McGrory, and the two of them setting off into the world to find their fortunes. During this journey, Edward visits an ethereal town called Spectre, whose residents appear almost too happy, one of whom, Norther Winslow, the poet laureate of Spectre, is played by Steve Buscemi. He and the giant also visit a traveling circus, where the giant finds employment, and Edward first sees Sandra, at this age played by Alison Lohman. He spends years working for the owner of the circus, played by Danny DeVito, to find out who she is. They finally meet and fall in love. This story appears to have a few tall tales in it. A giant is certainly atypical. The town of Spectre comes across more like a multi-level marketing company meeting, and DeVito's character is more otherworldly than even the most imaginative child could come up with. But okay, let's go with it. At least the gist of it is possible. In the third story, Edward is drafted into the army to fight in the Korean War. He parachutes into an enemy camp on a secret spy mission where the equivalent of a USO show is going on, starring a pair of beautiful Siamese twins. Edward hides in the twins' tents, where they find him after their show. He convinces them to help him escape by promising he will introduce them to Bob Hope, and Edward eventually returns home to Sandra. Now I'm thinking, this story is a little too hard to believe. Edward single-handedly completing a spy mission? A North Korean Army USO show, complete with a bad ventriloquist, who gets executed because he isn't funny, and a Siamese twin singing act? And how did Bob Hope get in there? Anyway, back in the present, while searching through Edward's old things, Sandra finds an old telegram from the Department of Defense, inaccurately informing her that Edward died in action. This surprises William, since this was a part of the story that Edward tells about in his Korean War adventure. Your father went missing. They thought he was dead. Oh, that really happened? Not everything your father says is a complete fabrication. William is beginning to understand. In the fourth story, Edward takes a job as a traveling salesman after returning from the war. While depositing money into a bank, he runs into Norther Winslow, who now is a bank robber. Edward inadvertently helps Norther with the robbery, but convinces Norther to go to Wall Street because that's where the real money is. Ah, come on now. How does one accidentally rob a bank and meet up with someone whose previous claim to fame was being the poet laureate of an Amway convention? Okay, back to the real world. While sorting through his father's things, 
William finds that his father's trust owns a house located in Spectre. Wait, what? Spectre exists? William drives out to Spectre and finds the house, which is occupied by Jenny Hill, played by Helena Bonham Carter, who also played the witch in the first story. Jenny was the young girl whom Edward met the first time he visited Spectre. She now tells William about his father's visits, which are eerily similar to Edward's stories. The tall tales come thick and fast here, including cars and trees and a woman in a lake, but the gist of it is, Edward finds the town in disarray and buys it so he can return it to its former glory. He fixes her dilapidated house with the help of his friend, the circus giant. Once the town is restored, Edward leaves for good, never to return. As for Jenny, she becomes a recluse. Some people say a witch. Hold on, a witch? Like the one in the first story? Now this story is too strange to be believed. Spectre actually exists? And Edward did visit it? Twice? And now he buys a town and restores it? And what's this about a giant again? Another Edward Tall tale, no doubt, and if this story keeps getting told at yearly Thanksgiving Day dinner tables, I can understand William's frustrations. However, this story isn't being narrated by Edward. It's being narrated by Jenny. Is she delusional too? Or maybe, well... William returns home to find that Edward was admitted to the hospital and the prognosis is grim. William stays to sit with Edward that night. Edward's doctor, played by Robert Guillaume, stops by on evening rounds and recounts the real story of William's birth. The doctor muses on it for a while, then leaves William alone with his father. The movie ends with Edward's death, funeral, and the aftermath, in which Edward reconciles with William in a touching way. The final scene shows William and Josephine raising their children in William's childhood home, where William assures his son's friends that those tall tales that William had been telling them about Edward are all true. Big Fish is a wonderful movie with a warm, comfortable feel. Each story has a fairy tale quality with unique and whimsical characters. Burton treats them gently. There are no macabre characters like the Joker or Beetlejuice here. The stories in Big Fish are shot mostly in soft focus with bright, sunny colors, as opposed to the darker palette that Burton usually uses, and the storyline is developed with a light touch. All this gives Big Fish a wondrous feel that is often missing in many other fantasy movies, and what drives this feel is Burton's portrayal of Edward's stories. Most contemporary critics saw Big Fish as focusing on the father-son relationship, and this makes sense. Tim Burton and the author of the book have both said that this was a primary goal of the movie, here I'm going to focus on something different. Big Fish is also about the value of storytelling. Big Fish received mixed reviews from some critics, many of which focus on Edward's storytelling. I'm going to defend Edward here because it is precisely Edward's storytelling that is the best part of Big Fish. Maybe Edward is a bore, but his stories are interesting and even the stories we don't hear completely sound good. The Maple Tree in the Buick is especially fascinating, I wish Burton had let Edward finish the story. Storytelling is a great tradition. The Brothers Grimm, Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway all wrote tall tales that entertain us, even if we don't believe them. I'm not sure that a frog would withstand being filled with buckshot to prevent his jumping, but that doesn't make the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County any less entertaining to read. Perhaps less believable, but is that important? William Bloom would argue that he is trying to learn about his father, and hearing the same tall tales that clearly cannot be taken at face value is frustrating. I get his point, and it's valid, but another point of Big Fish is that the stories are a part of who Edward is. When we first see Edward in bed, he is sick and weak and has no interest in anything, including eating. As he tells stories, Edward gets better. He sits up, starts to eat solid food, and becomes more animated. Telling stories is clearly a tonic for him. A key point is when William explains to Edward that he wants to find out who he is. Just show me who you are for once. I've been nothing but myself since the day I was born. And if you can't see that, it's your failing, not mine. Edward is a storyteller. Stories are to him like billiard balls. It doesn't matter in which direction you hit the ball. It matters where the ball ends up on the table. A more direct world can find that frustrating, but it's who Edward is. 
He'll get to the truth, or an approximation of it anyway, but he'll get there on his own time, with a few tall tales sprinkled in along the way. He says as much to Josephine when he says that William recounts events with all of the facts, but none of the flavor. He also takes the occasion to tell her a little about how he tells stories. You were talking about your wedding. I didn't forget. I was just working on a tangent. You see, most men, they'll tell you stories straight through. It won't be complicated, but it won't be interesting either. To get the full impact, the listener must be patient. Suspend belief here and there where it is needed, and just let the story wash over you. As we find out, Edward's real life was there to see in his stories all along. William was just so impatient to get to the facts that he didn't notice. It's like a health food fanatic who is so obsessed with the nutritional value of his meal that he ignores the flavor. That's fine if that's what you want, but storytellers and gourmands don't work that way. And if you're looking to understand them, you're going to have to meet them on their ground. It's rare to recapture as an adult the quality that in youth made time stand still, that gave an event the mystery of novelty. As we grow older, we comfort ourselves with the familiar, and as the world becomes more routine, time seems to speed up as life becomes a kaleidoscope of indistinguishable experiences. Without noticing, we shrink from the unknown, and as life goes on, new experiences become more and more rare until they vanish completely. Only an extraordinary event can jolt us out of the spiral and restore the innocence of those early years when each day was an adventure in defining the meaning of life. Burton jolts us out of our stupor with Big Fish. The scene in which Edward first glimpses Sandra is a wonder to behold. You experience Edward's fascination and exhilaration when he first sees his future wife, and you feel his excitement when he realizes that the rest of his life has just begun. But are the stories believable, and should that affect how the protagonist sees things? My favorite film director, John Ford, has an answer to this, and it's the same answer that William himself comes to at the end of Big Fish. Ford's 1963 western, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, tells the story of a famous late 19th century politician, played by James Stewart, who gained initial fame by ridding the town of a villain by killing him in a shootout. He confesses later at the end of the film that a different character, played by John Wayne, shot Valance to help Stewart, and subsequently died as an unknown pauper. The newspaper editor, who is listening to the story, decides not to print it. Well, you're not going to use the story, Mr. Scott? No, sir. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. What William Bloom finally realizes is that, for his father Edward, legend had become fact, and so it is now time to print the legend. Thanks for watching this video. I include a link below if you wish to see Big Fish, either online or if you wish to buy it. Please like and subscribe if you like this video and want to see more like it. I include links to other videos on my channel here, so please click on them if you have the time and are interested. Until next time, take care.